Well, hello. So, um, I wanted to talk about banjo history a little bit. And this goes from 3100 BC till 2022, if we think about the banjo as an instrument um, by different names, but the same instrument essentially. And um, <clears throat> what that looks like and what that means and and I thought I'd start with it coming to the US and then moving forward from there and yes I'm holding my six string droneless mountain banjo that I made in the last video um, we'll talk about that and what that means so if we think about uh, what the banjo was uh, originally it came from West Africa and um, came we, we were introduced in America to the banjo by African slaves on, and um, and in the same note they were also the banjo was being introduced to the Caribbean in uh, that same era because of slavery and it grew out of that and it was actually at that time uh, uh, what would be called a gourd banjo and, uh, you know, it was a gourd with a stick that would go through it. And um, and that's why it becomes what's known as a stick lute. And uh, I'll explain that. Uh, let me set my mountain banjo, this mountain banjo aside. And let's look at, I have another uh, six string um, drone list that I made with nylon strings. This one's a little fancier, and there is a resonator that can go on the back of it, and it does have a skin. It's just clear. Um, but you see this rod that goes through the banjo, and this one happens to be a piece of wood I turn on a lathe. Um, and it, this is goes into the neck. It's part of the neck, and it goes through the banjo body. In this case, it it's attached to the rim with screws. And thus it becomes a spike loop because it has a spike that goes through the instrument and uh, as a result um, they're part of what's called the spike lute family because of that spike going through it. Now, original banjos and I don't have an example of a gourd banjo or anything but originally a lot of the, er the early banjos the spike went through the piece of wood they weren't using screws and came out the other end and was attached that way. And a lot of times they'll have a, a, a piece of leather that goes over the spike on the end and the bridge is attached to, or the tailpiece is attached to that and allows it, it to go over the strings. The original banjo, uh, you can learn a lot about those. There are plenty of videos out there about that. Um, originally when they came to this country, uh, they, there, were, there were different configurations in terms of strings, etc. Uh, there was a standard three string for quite some time uh, and if you look over banjo history you see that they developed it you know from three to four to five and etc and um, in fact there's even a manufacturer in England uh, I believe in London that was um, manufactured a seven string so uh, back in the 19th century. So, so there was a lot of development. But the original, what we would call African banjo, um, was a gourd with a stick through it and X number of strings, uh, which developed into a five string and um, has a very warm, pleasant tone and is fretless as a general rule and uh, all of those things. And, and eventually, um, one of the innovations was that uh, sometimes cheese boxes started being used and a cheese box was round and already had some leather over it tacked onto it so that was great there's part of the banjo already finished and then the neck would be fastened on by running it through with the spike and attaching it at the tail and uh, that's kind of what defined the banjo look and shape in America and uh, then, you know, and, and incidentally, when we think about that, the banjo was, uh, is often called America's instrument. I, I don't know that, I, I love the sound of that, and, and I see that, and yet it crosses boundaries uh, globally, and uh, it also in time. 
And, and so we, we see that, uh, and we'll see that in the history. Well, as we continue to look forward a little bit with history, and then we'll go back pre-Africa. And, uh, but if we look forward, what we see is it, there was a time, uh, you know, at the end of the, sin, of the 19th century and the early 20th where it was turning uh, dominantly, the banjo was, was, there was a banjo craze that took place. And, um, and part of that was because of minstrel shows, minstrel banjos have a very beautiful tone. And that was, there was a growing interest um, Always knowing, you know, and, and there are some racial issues attached to that because sometimes it was done in blackface, which is disrespectful, and et cetera. But um, that's what was happening. It's a matter of our history, unfortunately. And, but the banjo grew, and it became more standardized. And um, all pre-Civil War banjos, you know, would tend to be gut strings, um, fretless, things like that. Um, the early uh, classical style playing banjo, you would actually use three fingers and a thumb, which is like classical guitar, and play the note, the various notes in the measure a lot, plucking them a lot like a classical guitarist would play. Now, the before that, the, the old style banjo playing, which is often called hammer and claw, claw hammer um, style, where you use your thumb and your four fingers, some people use two fingers, um, that's very African and that beat, that approach, everything is very, uh, that's how the original instrument was played in Africa. So we get that. And then, and then plectrum started being used and so on. Um, then with the banjo craze, uh, and then we enter the jazz age, uh, banjo began to change a lot. Um. It also they they didn't have the backs on them they you know like this this one I I I have one for it but I took it off so it's an open back um, the the purpose of that back is it's called a resonator is it projects sound forward and makes them a great deal louder if you that's a loud instrument there um, I'm not that's not a very pretty sound because I wasn't playing it what we have here is a tenor banjo. Shorter neck, four strings. These were tuned originally like violas were tuned, and and so they could be played like that and and strummed. And there are many uh, people that still play them that way, and and they're they use a plectrum and they strum, and and it's it's quite a beautiful sound. Now something else happened with this style banjo, with the tenor banjo, is um, it also became a part of the Irish American community, and they. They ended up with what they would call an Irish tenor tuning, and um, it at that point would be tuned an octave lower than a mandolin, or as the case may also be, an octave lower than a violin, um, because the mandolin and violin tune the same, and they would be played a lot like a, the the old style mandolin, maybe not so bluegrassy, but where you pick out the melody, and you play. That and I could give an example of that on some other video, uh, but then uh, some of that ended up going to Ireland, and um, the the band, the Irish tenor banjo, became a, a significant part of Irish music, and and in fact, I believe it was in the sometime in the '60s, it became one of the national instruments there, and and there were banjo factories, you know, even in the 19th century in England. Where they made five string banjos, and as I said, some six string, some six string droneless, um, so on and so forth. And it, it grew out of that. Um, before I get into this, the, the, the six string discussion, um, I'll, I'll talk about mountain banjos a little bit. Uh, but before I get to that, before I talk about mountain banjos, let me talk about the tenor banjo and the jazz age. It was, it was here that the banjo really began to get innovative, um, the American banjo. It, uh, the, the tension hooks, these hooks that you tighten that make the skin tighter to get more volume. Uh, and this is, this is a little Gretsch that I, that I got. It's kind of a little vintage Gretsch. Um, but it, uh, they, they figured out ways to get the skin tighter by using these hooks and bolts. They use mechanical um, 
uh, different style mechanical pegs, um, much like these, and start putting frets in and using steel strings and steel reinforcing the necks and all of this to get more punch, more volume. That's when the resonators that started being put on the back like that because the sound from the back of the banjo hits this hard resonator and pushes it forward. So, and even the armrests, a lot of these these mechanical features that we see as commonplace on the banjo were a result of the jazz age and really starting with four string banjos, um, not the five strings. Uh, so, so that's an interesting thing. And then it grew into the five strings from there. And um, now we'll talk about mountain banjos briefly. And here's an example of my, I don't even know if it's in tune, my uh, five string mountain banjo. I didn't play it today, so it's hard to say. Well, it is kind of in tune. I, I should have prepared. And, and you can see a video of me playing this that when I make it, etc. And I've done some songs on it. And, and this, I love this instrument. It's fun. It's quirky. It's a five-string mountain banjo. It's very old school. Um, this is what would have happened in the Appalachian Mountains making a five-string banjo, which is great fun in its own right. And uh, this is actual genuine goat skin. And, and so in the process, uh, the mountain banjo comes into being if you've studied, you know, Appalachia very much and, uh, and looked at some of that. You, you, you know that uh, the Scotch-Irish and some Germanic people uh, moved into that area of the United States because they weren't always well received here. And um, during somewhere during that time frame, you know, they were largely accordion uh, fiddle, uh, maybe some guitar, etc. But during that era, you know, railroads are being built and what people are, group are they using to build railroads but slaves and a lot of the Appalachian people are hearing these big gourd banjos played and they're figuring out how to make their own out of plank wood and, and the mountain banjo is essentially born. Um, and, and that isn't to say there weren't African Americans living in Appalachia building banjos. I'm, of course there were. And, a, and it really grew even more post-Civil War because of the freedom and, and, and that, that, ever, that was received for, by the African American community, which is wonderful. And, and so the banjo develops and it grows and, and it keeps moving forward. Now, if we look at that, we... Um, during the Jazz Age, another thing that was happening, this is an example of a um, plectrum banjo. Now this is the same 26 inch scale length that a five string banjo would have. It just doesn't have a drone string. And the purpose of, uh, the, and I made this particular instrument, um, and, and that that's why you'll see the the resonators different and and uh, wooden armrests things like that. This one has a double rod system that goes through it, like a, as a spike. I don't know if you can see through. You can see the rods uh, through the the skin. So there's your spike loot. Um, and uh, the only banjo I, banjos I have that don't have a rod going through them are the mountain banjos. And uh, what happened? During the jazz age, when they were trying to keep a beat and really play it, they there were banjoists that started taking the drone string off and playing it without a drone string. Someone would take that fifth string tuner out, um, which I, I, the other day I was watching a jazz banjo play, player and he had, was playing a five string without, and he just pulled the, the tuner out, no drone string, and it, you essentially have a plectrum banjo at that point. Um, traditionally... Uh, these are tuned um, very much like the original tunings of the banjos. Now when I say that, there is a multitude of banjo tunings out there. So one, one person estimated uh, 124 different ways to tune a banjo. That's amazing. I may, uh, perhaps. I have no idea. I know uh, I use an a app for tuning my guitar and banjos and etc. And uh, it has 14 different five-string banjo tunings. So 
Uh, but, but these are tuned to what's called a C tuning. Um, so you would have a, a, a C, a G, a B, and a D. And, and so close to the G tuning, but it's called a C tuning. And then, there, of course, there's a double C tuning where the B string becomes a C. But these are tuned like the standard C tuning. Um, now it's called plectrum tuning. Original, that was, a, that was kind of a standard banjo tuning that got changed later. Um, and these were part of the jazz age. And, and so they could keep a similar beat to the tenor banjos. Now, what a lot of people are used to seeing when they think of a banjo is more uh, of this kind of configuration where you have a tuner up here. This is not a five string banjo. This is actually has six strings. And so if you look at the headstock, you've got one, two, three, four, five tuners in this headstock and you've got your drone string. That makes it a six string banjo. Um, in England, uh, I think it was Zither, uh, was making these um, in, in 1860 New York. This is, you know, it's called, I also often will call it a, a Teed style banjo. Um, George Teed was making six, six string banjos of this nature. Um, what happened with me was, uh, you know, there's a video on how I built this one. Um, I thought, well, I'm going to make a neck for this pot that I have, and I might as well make a neck that you can't get. So I made a six string banjo neck and, and put it on this pot and built this banjo. Um, but this is more of the five string. When people think of bluegrass banjos, they look a lot more like this. Um, all the amenities with this extra tuner. Um, and and that's, that's really old school in a lot of ways. Uh, and then we come to uh, I'll just use my mountain banjo as an example. Um, you have a six string droneless. And um, that's a lot of people make the mistake of calling these banjitars, etc. That's not what they are. Um, according to Deering Banjo, right, they had a wonderful article about it. You start looking it up in history, it's not, it's considered a six string banjo. Um, there are some purists, five string purists, you know, like I said, there are some banjo players that think there's only one banjo and only one way to play it and only one way to tune it and everyone else is a faker. Um, I don't know. I don't think much of that attitude uh, I th because the banjo has evolved through the years into a lot of different things. They're all legitimate. Um, so. They'll say, oh, band guitar players are too lazy to learn to play the banjo. Uh, you know, I did. I learned to play the banjo. I learned to play it in C tuning and open G tuning. Um, and uh, I also can play uh, the tenor banjo when it's tuned like a viola. I, play, I can play Irish tenor banjo um, because I was a mandolin player before and I went online and learned some Irish tunes on the banjo. Um, so I, you know, you, I can't say that's true of me. I learned to play, um, but I, I happen to like the six string droneless. Um, it, it's a nice fit for me. And um, that was what, what was happening was banjo players uh, because it was uh, guitar was a very popular instrument really um, because it didn't have as much volume. They were always trying to figure out you know, how do I get lower notes? How do I get more notes? So if you look at the Teed style six string that I talked about, this black one, um, I can go uh, to a very low octave G. I can play uh, two to three octaves on that instrument. So, so that's really something. And the same thing on the six string droneless, you can, you can get more lower notes. So, so that was happening. And, uh, you know, over the years, other things have developed out of that. There are mandolins that have banjo bodies for the much same reason, the volume. There are ukulele banjos, which are four strings. Uh, you say, well, that's not okay. I suppose anything's okay. Uh, there are solid body electric band, five string banjos out there, and there's been some great work done on that. In fact, uh, one of the greatest banjo players of all time, Bella Fleck, I, I've seen videos of him playing a solid string electric back in the day. And, and then uh, there are, you know, when you want to talk about banjo guitars, there are such creatures as this. This one I made out of a palette. Um, 
and it happens to be a six string uh, where you have five strings and your drone string and uh, I built it onto a guitar body which I made the top of the guitar body out of pallets and you play it just like an open string G tuning banjo uh, and it has a guitar sound so uh, I don't know what kind of aberration that is but uh, it's legit and there you have it so that's going forward who knows what banjos will look like as as we continue to move forward they're innovative I think what we learn about that history is uh, there isn't a standard to say banjos have to be a certain thing. They were born uh, in, in, innovation, in innovation and they continue to be. Now, so we see that. Now I talked about, you know, it all for us in America, it all comes from West Africa. And, and we owe them that debt. It's their heritage, and we get to share it with them. Um, and it, was, it came because of slavery, which was wrong. Uh, you know, uh, some of you will even know I wrote a history of the black church, that, and I addressed the wrongs of slavery in that process. But also, you know, it changed Christianity for the better. Um, so we, we, I understand that. But um, when we, we look at this whole process... Um, going back now, uh, where was the banjo? It wasn't called that. At the you know banjo came from the the slave name, but the African American uh, influence in that you know I don't like to say the word slave, but it it's a it's a dark true history of our past and it's unfortunate. But where did the banjo come from? How did it get to West Africa? Are there is there evidence in what we would actually more than history when we get into antiquities, think in terms of archaeology, are there examples of banjos that are older? Um, if you think of this instrument with a a roundish body and a and a skin and some sort of animal skin head and a long neck, you know, what about those? Well, you can go back to 1500 BC and discover an instrument, uh, evidence of an instrument in, in hieroglyphics uh, in, called the Egyptian lute, um, which looks very much like a banjo and very much like the African version of that where the strings are being tied to the neck to give the tones and tuning and not just twisted. Um, so there's 1500 BC, we see that. Well, where did that come from? That's about the era that the Canaanites were actually overrunning and, and, and in the, from the Mesopotamian plain were ruling over a lot of Egypt at that time and having a strong influence. Well, then we, we go into Mesopotamia, the Middle East, that Fertile Crescent area, and there they discover uh, a ring seal uh, with carvings of banjo-like instruments. And... And we find in archaeology that they had an instrument also that is called the Mesopotamian lute. Uh, and it's the same basic structure. Um, and it uh, dates to 3100 BC. So, you know, at this point we're talking 5,000 years ago in the Middle East, there's an instrument that resembles a banjo. Uh, it's it's interesting to me, um, and and from what we can tell, it's it's Akkadian, uh, and that's fascinating for me as a as a Christian only because you know uh, if we look at the patriarch Abraham in the Old Testament, uh, we often call him Father Abraham, right? Uh, he uh, he dates to 1900 B.C. So in all likelihood, he had 300 plus uh, slaves and servants and, and herdsmen, etc. Uh, at one point, uh, there, it's it's theoretically probable that there is at some point you would have heard the sound of a Mesopotamian lute in his camp somewhere. Someone was likely playing one. I know that's conjecture, but you know it's it's theoretically possible. I think it's funny uh, if you heard that. And um, so that's happening. Now, the significance of that is um, we can go east a bit and discover other, well, we can discover, we can go north of the Mesopotamian plain and discover an instrument 
or east uh, and, and look at the Persian tar, which is a word that means, uh, if I'm not mistaken, four strings. And it's a gourd. It's not really a gourd. It's carved out of wood. It's double round like an hourglass with a skin over it and strings. And it, it again, is banjo-like with a different tuning. But how many different tunings for the banjo are there? And then you, uh, you can go a little further east. And you find this, in, and in China, you find uh, an, an instrument that has three strings, a long neck, uh, a rounded squarish body is how they made it, covered with skin. Python skin is traditional, and um, it's called a sanxian, it means three strings, and sounds very much like a banjo, because, you know, that's what it sounds like. And we've probably seen them played. You could Google that and watch a video. And I think if you heard someone really going at one, you would think, wow, that that's an interesting sound, a banjo-ish type sound. In Japan, uh, that, that instrument migrated to Japan. They have a different name for it, and which escapes me. It's, it's SH something. And um, it's, a, it's just called that because in Japanese, it means three strings. And it's essentially the same instrument. It looks similar, roundish body, long neck, three strings, and snake skin. Um, so, so these are all, there you have this tradition moving all over from the Middle East. And, and it's fascinating in that um, when we think it's a global instrument that, uh, and I don't mean this in any kind of spiritual religious way, it's just historically interesting that here's this instrument in the Mesopotamian plain that goes eastward, uh, you know, because we had the this, this Silk Road uh, towards China, and they find those in China in the 700 AD. They, there's evidence, uh, you know, um, of the Sanxian. Uh, so uh, there, there are all those um, pathways. You find the Egyptian lute. It makes its way to Africa and, and then somehow, or to West Africa, somehow that makes its way to, to the Americas, on, you know, through unfortunate circumstances, really. But then it becomes what we call the American instrument. Clearly it's not uh, limited to that. And, and then, uh, you know, we, we end up with manufacturers in England making instruments in the 19th century, making banjos and and then the Irish adopt it. It's also in Scottish music. It's a Celtic instrument. If you if you see that, it's a very you know. And it all, you know, you can't say, oh, that was ours. We invented it. You know, uh, we we got it from someone who brought it here, and and it looks like they got it from someone, and and, and it just grows that way, which is interesting. And and it uh, in the same note, you say, well, yeah, but we use finger picks. Well, not all banjos. I just showed you a. Plectrum banjo uses a flat pick and and is played that way. But yeah, we use finger picks. Here's my thumb pick and my finger picks are clear and they're a little different. I don't know if you can see them. They go over my finger so um, I can move my finger both directions to play. And I really like these, uh, these picks. Um, and so... And what's fascinating if you study the history of finger picks, uh, ancient China had finger picks. They were often horn that was attached to the fingers that they would use to pick with. The Japanese used finger picks. I believe they were called koto picks. They used bone. Um, some, some finger picks I've seen pictures of from antiquities were actually whole bone hollowed out and cut at an angle that kind of resemble the ones I use that they'd stick over their finger. Um, in Persia, they had uh, wire picks that would fit over the fingernails and play. So, you know, you could see that on the, on the, the Persian tar, perhaps. And then uh, there was a style of finger pick made out of tortoise shell in, in uh, Portugal. And, and um, so there, they go way back to antiquities, long before the U.S. was thinking in ter was even a country or a nation or a continent continent or a colony and, and so there you have that and and so you begin to wonder when you think it uh, 
you know, does that sound a little bit like a, a Chinese sing and I, I don't know, but it's kind of fun to think about. And so then here in America, we fast forward a little bit and you think, well, wait a second, you know, just like the slaves brought the gourd banjo and we know that the Sanxian could have dated to 700 AD, in the mid 1800s, uh, there were Chinese laborers coming to this country working on railroads. Did they bring their instruments with them? Did they make similar instruments? Um, I don't know. I know it was an instrument of slaves meant to entertain the elite. And so um, here we have this fascinating concept of music and a, in particular a musical instrument that goes, you know, in history, different directions. We talked about it going forward from Africa, backward into archaeology from Africa, uh, and, and finding its way to the Orient uh, in a different format, set up the same with three strings, open tuning. A lot of banjos were three strings, open tuning. We know there are several different types of tuning available, included one, uh, you know, of some five string players do do this, and, and even four string players use what's called, we call a Chicago tuning, which is tuned like a guitar. Um, and, and of course, you got your purists out there. Uh, oh, that's not a real banjo playing. Well, you know, it, it is because they're playing a real banjo. And, and we know that various tunings are acceptable. People have been creative all along. And, and so that's the, the, I think that's the, the moral to the story is if we start, well, I appreciate people that, that preserve history and heritage because without them, what would we have? You know, so are those, those folks who are absolute purists that, that develop it old school a certain way so that it matches perfectly and preserve that, uh, the, the hours they dedicate to that and the time they spend is, is admirable. And, and I think that's a wonderful thing. Certainly there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's a positive thing for us. And yet, uh, if you're going to do that and yet you at the same time won't give room for innovation or creativity of, to people who want to move forward with that, um, aren't you going against the very nature of the banjo? You know, um, one of the, I made a joke in another video, you know, about how, um, you know, how many banjo players does it take to change a light bulb? Eleven. One to change the bulb, five to complain that it's electric, and five to say that's not how Earl would have done it. And, and I mentioned in that, that Earl Scruggs changed the face of banjo playing. He popularized the open G tuning using his three-fingered picking style with picks. Um in a way that wasn't being done. Uh, and it's it's an amazing f art form. A and mo there's a tremendous body of five string banjo players that learn that and want to learn it and, and do it very well. Um, and, and it's admirable, it's beautiful, but I don't think they should restrict others who are going a different direction. That'd be like, you know, those on the Chinese sing scene saying it can only be played this way or the African banjo can only be played this way, or the, you know, all of a sudden all these instruments are limited, yet they were all innovated. And uh, we can get real narrow-minded and, and prejudiced about a lot of things, I suppose. And, and I hope you've enjoyed this banjo history, and, and what spurred that in my mind, of course, was, and these are all just things I've read over the, the season, was building a mountain banjo, because the mountain banjo was an innovation that started something new for poor people that couldn't just go buy one in the store. And, um, and this particular mountain banjo, the six string droneless mountain banjo, using a synthetic head, right? A synthesized leather, but it's synthetic, uh, was an innovation. It was something that people aren't doing. You can't go out and buy one. Um, and it's, it was part of the creativity process. Uh, isn't that fun? It'd be interesting to see what what is in the future for such things. And so we don't want to be people who get stuck in the mud. And that's true of our music. It's true of our instruments. And it's more true than anything of our faith and walk with Jesus Christ. That we, we don't want to become legalists that keep people from growing. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this history. The Lord bless you. And we'll see you next time.